We have more divisions today than ever before. May I ask you to begin our program, President John Silver. Yes, to say things have not changed is to distort the facts beyond recognition. Things have changed immeasurably. Uh, there are many improvements that we should not overlook despite the fact that much remains to be done. We should remember uh, that in 1965, you didn't even have blacks able to attend restaurants in most cities. They couldn't even use the bathroom or the toilet uh, in a, a U.S. highway. Uh, these, these conditions, at least, have been overcome. One thing we do have to recognize, however, is that the corrective measures that should have been taken in the middle 60s to help and support black families were not done. The provision of preschool education Head Start opportunities for black children and for poor children generally uh, was not done in any substantial way. Sister Soldier, a raptivist, a, a musical artist and uh, also a political activist, found herself on the cover of Newsweek magazine. Sister Soldier, what, what are your thoughts as you listen in on, this, on these opening comments? I think that there have been gains for individual people, but we as African people as a collective have not moved forward as we should. And most of the time, the African people that you have that are able to occupy the positions of mayors and governors do not occupy it forcefully and forthrightly for the collective of African people in this country. And as a result, what you have is millions of young African and Latino children and youth who are in a state of total chaos who don't have skills and don't have any idea how they're going to develop their skills and are estranged from even the adults in their own race because of the problem of not dealing with white racism and the real impact that it has on our lives. Alan Keyes spoke at the, at the Republican convention this year. You are a candidate, sir, for the United States Senate from Maryland where you oppose incumbent uh, Democratic Senator uh, Barbara Mikulski, who, yes, was invited to appear on our panel and declined. Increasing numbers of black uh, Americans, including you, uh, Dr. Keyes, have stood to say that too many minority people in this country have internalized the process of the dole, of the handout. Woe is me, I'm black and therefore I can do nothing. I received a terrible education in a racist society. Where is my handout? Is that a fair characterization of your feeling about what has happened? to the spirit and the soul of some minority people in this country? Well, I would say what has happened, because it's not like lightning striking from above. Evolve. I would have to say what, what has been done. You know, this was done. You, you, you have programs where you wrote the rules and regulations in such a way as to discourage work, to break up families, uh, to actually penalize people who were trying to, to help themselves. So, so don't tell me that this suddenly happened to folks. It was done to folks. Uh, and now we're going to have to make some active efforts to undo it. And I'm not uh, one of those folks who's going to say there was a big conspiracy uh, to destroy people. But it does seem to me that you couldn't have thought of a better conspiracy to destroy black leadership, the black community, black institutions, uh, than, than what, what posed as this uh, effort in the bureaucratic uh, welfare state to help people. And so I think we need to think it through, try to undo its damage, which is going to take uh, conscious use of the same power that helped to produce that damage, uh, and then concentrate on allowing people to have the power uh, to shape their own destiny. Daruba bin Wahad, you served 19 years uh, for uh, attempted murder of two policemen, a judgment that was overturned more recently on the basis of uh, an unfair trial and the withholding of information. Let me ask you, uh, Daruba bin Wahad, how you feel as you, what jumped out at you on that piece? When we look at these young men um, on the screen here, one of the young brothers said, you know, what do you know how to do? He said, rob, steal, and kill. What did Columbus know how to do when he came here? Rob the native people of their land, kill them, and exploit them? What did they know how to do? What is in the best tradition of capitalism in this society? Burning, loot, rape, and pillage. This is something that is as integral to the United States as breathing. And the problem with race in this country is that white people in this country do not want to confront their own history and live up to the consequences of that history. And when you don't confront the truth, the truth will ultimately destroy you. Does, uh, 
Does Mr. Wahad make you squirm at all, Richard Nathan, director of the Nelson Rockefeller Institute of Government of the State University of Albany uh, of New York? You were an original member of the Kerner Commission. How do you respond to the uh, angry observations of well, Mr. Bin Wahad? Actually, I was the research director of the commission, and looking back, it's now 25 years. Uh, I think there's good news and there's bad news. We've talked a little bit about the good news. The bad news, and I agree with Mr. Wahad, is that in the inner cities, what he's talking about is deepening violence. The inner city conditions, I think, are worsening. But the flip side of that is that there are new neighborhoods, middle class, black neighborhoods in lots of cities that are fighting hard to stave off the effects of inner city problems and violence. And there's a large increase in lots of big cities in suburban uh, African-American neighborhoods that are actually in many cases quite well off. Part of the bad news agenda that uh, worries me is that the mood is is worsening. There's there's a backlash, there's a deeper feeling about racism in the black community and there's a hardening attitude I think in the white community. So it's a worrisome time, I grant you that. Yeah, but you know think that he just did exactly what Deruba brought up, which is that when we deal with the issue of white racism, white people don't deal with the fact that they are the ones who are sicker than anybody else in this particular issue, which is why when you deal with the question of race, you cannot deal with what's wrong with these African people. See, the thing that happened in South Central started with a malady in the justice system where white people could not see white men who had did something against black men and penalize them for what everybody in this country knows that they did. So the problem of white racism is that we don't look in depth and do these little documentaries on white people and what's wrong with them. I like to, uh, I like to, uh, I like to add to that. The professor, um, um, uh, the president, uh, John Silver, said that um, one of the problems with the programs of the 60s was that they did not provide corrective measures to help the black family. We need to understand that when black people were brought here to the United States, they were brought here as an act of war. They were kidnapped here, and the destruction of the black family and the creation of a slave mentality was an integral part of the development of this nation state. So there has never been an interest in the black family, and that's reflected today. But even more, every city in which we have aspired to so-called political power. In, New in, in, in Newark, black males are being murdered by the, New by the Newark Police Department under the guise that they're robbing cars. When we look at, at, at New York City, the police riot in the streets. When we look at L.A., there was a riot in the streets. All of these cities have black mayors. Yeah. So we have to begin to understand that moving black people up the economic ladder does not necessarily mean that black people on the bottom of the economic ladder are going to be empowered because yeah. there are black people who identify with the system so much that they are self-hating Negroes. Mr. Bin Mohad, you seem to be going kaboom to the entire white community. Do we have from you a, a, a spirit of of belief that there really are out there in America white folks who do not suffer from the pathology that Sister Soldier reminds us does exist in this in this country. But why is that the question? In other words, it's the same as when you're dealing with the issue in South Africa. People say, well, if black people get in control of that government, what will they do with the white people who are living there? Why is that the question? Can we refocus the uh, question like to as to how we want to correct let me have a moment, let me have a moment to, to defend my question. Okay. If you believe that all people who, all uh, people who are uh, white are interested in pillaging, reminding us, as you painfully do, of our own history. No, no, that's then, a mischaracterization. That's a mischaracterization, and first of all, it's the mischaracterization because the Constitution was established by white males with property. It said all men are created equal, right. and they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. It didn't say women were created equal with men, right. and, and, and the Bill of Rights was attached to the Constitution because people without property had no rights. So I did not say that all white people are interested in burning and, and, and looting and pillaging. I am saying that the ideals that established this country were based on burning, looting, and pillaging people's Except land. Except your point. And you concede to us that 
In, in, in contemporary society, we do have honorable people of all colors who have as much of an interest in the salvation of their babies as... But the problem with that, the problem with that, Phil, is that the people of good, of good intentions in the white community are the minority. The, they do not stand on principle and they do not struggle against their own racism and white skin privilege. See, the problem, the problem is this. It's like men who say, I understand how you feel as a woman being subjected to sexist uh, uh, behavior. They can't possibly. Assume. Not without interacting with women and empowering them. Well, the, the problem, though, I think with this whole analysis, as I see it, uh, we're talking, and I have great respect for the Constitution, but let's be frank, it was not based upon an idealistic view of human beings. Mm -hmm. uh, Deruba doesn't realize that I think something, that what he's saying is a description of not white people, but all people, was in fact the foundation of America's political philosophy. People are greedy, give them a chance, they'll beat you up. Give them a chance, they'll kill you, rape that's not, you, that's not rob what you. Was saying. That was exactly, if I may say so, the view of human beings, not just white human beings, but most well, human beings. Have we moved somewhat of, off no, this animalistic, no, primitive? No. The point is, however, that the point that I think I hear at least, what Sister Soldier says and, and, and others say, has less to do, we talk about all this economic redistribution and so forth. Let's talk about the basic issue of politics. The basic issue of politics is power. If you have power over me, you're going to abuse it. If I have no power to resist you, then I'm going to be abused. And I don't care what's in your heart. I don't want to know what's in your heart half the time. I want to know whether there's a weapon in your hand and whether I have the means to defend myself against it. Could be economic, could be social, could be political, could be physical, but I've got to be able to defend myself because I can't trust you. And that's an American statement. There is that is no not a statement of some idea. There is no human soul to be found anywhere. That's not the point. The point is that if you give people power over you and you can't defend yourself against them, our founders said they will abuse you and the world, if I don't mind my saying so, from a black person's point of view, I don't have to prove to you that somebody's out to get me. There are 400 years of history in this country that people are out to get me and they got me more than half the time. I don't have to prove that to anybody. Jonathan Kozol, whose seminal book, Death at an Early Age, was a personal account of his own experience of teaching fourth grade in the community of Roxbury, the minority community within the city of Boston. Mr. Kozol, you've been patient, sir. What are your thoughts as you listen in on our dialogue? Well, I didn't think I'd ever agree with Alan Keyes on anything, but I sure agree with what he just said. I started teaching, as you know, in a segregated school in the mid-60s. Today, inner city schools everywhere are more segregated and less equal than they were at the time I set out as a teacher. Inner city kids I see all over the country are in squalid, ugly, filthy, overcrowded buildings in which not one of us would willingly spend one hour. Their lives are more miserable today than they were when I began. By any kind of statistics, I won't drown you in statistics, but there's one which is so devastating, I have to cite it here. As you know, Phil, tracking has come back into schools again. It's become a, a sort of fashionable way of segregating kids within a single school. Black children, statistically, are three times as likely to be tracked into so-called special classes for the retarded mm. as white children, but only half as likely to be put into gifted programs. That is an intolerable statistic in a democracy. And anybody who looks at that and all the other statistics, the fact that black infant mortality is twice that of white children, anyone who looks at those kinds of statistics, or a recent news event, black Haitians being brutally excluded from this country while white Europeans are welcomed at New York International Airport. Any, any, anyone who looks at that knows in their heart that racism yeah. remains the yeah. central moral agony of this society. Yeah. So my pleading to Mr. Bin Wahad and to Dr. Keyes uh, in the white liberal tradition of, gee, you don't totally dislike us, do you, is a rather empty I'll kind of... I'll tell you why I think it is, Phil, because not to criticize you, naturally I'd like to feel, you know, I'm a nice guy, I hope black people will like me, but that's wasted energy. It, the issue isn't whether they like you and me or not. The issue is whether they have an even shot in this society, agree, and they sir. can't afford to worry about our injured feelings. I, yes, and I they ask for only one thought. moment to defend the question. Yeah. Yeah. If, if, if the anger is that overwhelming, and the evidence supported by your scholarship uh, makes clear their positions, 
then we have to wonder whether we're whether we should even waste any more energy with this ideal of integration and living together and cooperating. I ask you not because I'm an insecure person who wants to be loved. I have children who must live in the society. What we're talking about here is very clear. If you look at Latin America today, in every society in Latin America, and Latin America is essentially a conglomeration of European settler states. The conquistadores went in there and did the same thing that the English did here and everything, right? When we look at the compositions of these societies, we see that at the top are light-skinned descendants of conquistadores, and at the bottom are native people and black descendants of Africans. White skin privilege is a, is a European ideal and concept that was exported with their economic system, their religious philosophy, and it was exported and imposed on people of color. So when we talk about Latinos, let's understand what we're saying here. We're talking about Latinos who for the best part, for the most part, have African blood in them. And they have internalized racism just like everybody else. When we look at Asian Americans, many of the Asians that came here initially came to work the railroads. They were treated like dogs. They were treated like dirt. But when we see a lot of Asians that come to the United States today, one of the first words they learn in their lexicon, one of the first things that they learn is nigger. The United States' major contradiction around the issue of race is white skin male privilege. And if we don't attack that, if we don't analyze that, if we don't begin to deal with that, then we got a problem. And I totally disagree with the mayor of, of, of Washington because I do not have a stake in saving a racist nation. I do not have a stake in maintaining American hegemony over people of color around the world. I do not have an interest in maintaining this system that causes the miseries of billions of people one more moment. Yeah, well, I'm not going to walk away from our uh, con uh, investment in this country and the suffering that we've had in this country since 1619. We gave this country her culture. We gave this country her music. We gave this country her margin of profit with the agricultural revolution, though we never got our 40 acres and a mule. I'll be doggone if I'm walking away from four centuries of investment in this country. We, too, are entitled to a piece of the rock. I don't care how wrong America was. No, May no, no, no. I call this uh, audience to the please? We must move on. And in addition to our panelists, we've invited three distinguished observers to give their widely differing perspectives on where we go from here. They are Time Magazine correspondent Sylvester Monroe, journalist and businessman Tony Brown, and Princeton professor Cornell West. Gentlemen, we do thank you for joining us. Let's begin with Mr. Monroe and the case for government assistance. I have just uh, reviewed Sylvester Monroe's uh, review of his own return to the uh, school of his youth. Um, uh, did you, is there anything you wanted to add to what you've said? Um, I might ask you about your own personal feelings as you walked uh, past those graffiti-covered uh, walls. Well, it, what's, what's interesting about going back there, what's painful about going back there, is people talk about these communities and how people uh, ought to pick themselves up by their bootstraps, they ought to do that. That was a community that regularly, routinely produced successful members of society when it had the support necessary to do that. And it pains me to hear people talk about uh, a welfare state, um, uh, people uh, who, who want a handout. What, this, what communities like this, what black people have always asked for, is not a handout. They are citizens of this country. What they're asking for is equal access to opportunity, to education. Government has a role. And no one is saying that government can solve all the problems there. But, and part of that role is to provide a quality of education that means something. That school used to have that. What? Why is it that government, that the, the, the Lyndon Johnson uh, era, which is the time I would assume you were a student at that school. That's right. I, well, what's different then? Why can't it work now? Well, one of the things I think that uh, when I was a student in the Chicago public school system, never one day in the 10 years that I was a student in the Chicago public schools did I miss a day of school because of a teacher strike or because there was not enough money to keep the schools open. Perhaps that was because the Chicago public school systems were then a majority white system. The Chicago public school system today is majority minority. And so now we can't find the money anymore. So white power fled then. 
or at least turned its back on it has turned this its back it has turned its back so at the question that Paul Solomon asked at the top of this piece why should people and people will say to you well my kids don't go to that school I don't live in that community what does that have to do with me it has everything to do with you this is a democracy we pay taxes we to uh, distribution of wealth shared wealth in this country is a, is a, is one of the foundations of this country if we don't educate those children we can't build enough prisons we can't rebuild LA enough times everyone I mean I understand why this gentleman feels he doesn't have a stake in this society but everybody will pay if we don't how, how would Mr. Kozol respond to Mr. Monroe's observation which suggests that when the white man goes, so does the power. Absolutely. I mean, I completely agree with him. In Chicago, nothing he said was overstated. A couple months ago, the Chicago school system, abandoned by white people, not just white children, but white business, everyone, had to start rationing toilet paper. Children now have to bring no, it from home. It's is, absolute apartheid today in Chicago. The issue is more than just money. It's also an issue of control and curriculum and what type of African adults are you trying to produce within that school system. I was in the Intelligent and Gifted Children's Program. I went to Cornell University Preparatory. I was on welfare, Head Start, free lunch, free breakfast, force busing for integration. Every single government program ever created, I have been. Yeah, here you participating. are on the cover of Newsweek magazine. It must have worked. That's not the point, because I talked about white people. That was why I was on the cover. <laughs> Celebrating my academic victory. Your point is made. Right. So the point becomes, my point becomes, Phil, that how you design those programs. In all of the programs that I attended, all of the education that I had, college, public, and otherwise, nobody ever told me that I was an African woman. Nobody ever told me what the history of African people were. Nobody ever told me that America is business and without business you will have nothing and be nothing. And nobody ever told me how to organize business so that I would be able to develop institutions in my own community. So now the sincerity, the sincerity of all of the programs and all of the education has to be questioned indicted and convicted because the bottom line is that America is not and has never tried to produce African adults who are functional, self-sufficient, who understand their politics, their economics, and their relationship to the world politics and the world economics. America is, America is never going to. America is never going to understand that as some abstraction. Communities understand that. You must give communities the power and the control and finally address the whole point. You can't just pour money into a school. You've got to build up in the community the economic base to sustain the school. You can't deal with these problems in isolation and say I'll have a good school in a neighborhood with no economic base and no jobs and no businesses. You want decent schools, you've got to develop the communities in which those schools exist so that you have an economic base to support them. You've got to develop the power politically so that the community will be able to control that environment in which the school exists and meet the needs culturally, value-wise, otherwise that that community reflects. And that means that you've got to have power in the hands of that community as a whole. Not not in the hands of education bureaucrats, not in the hands of social bureaucrats, but in the hands of the people of the community themselves. There is a gentleman in our room who believes he has an answer to your uh, very optimistic uh, call for uh, jobs and empowerment. The issue is race. We'll continue following this brief break for your public television station. Well, Tony Brown... For a talk show host, you've been unusually well-behaved throughout this uh, program, and I thank you for your patience. Uh, do I sound like a, uh, a white racist to say, see what I mean? You can pull yourselves up by your bootstraps. Does that make you nervous if I say something like that? No, but the context would make me nervous if you were suggesting, and you're not, that all blacks had to do was to go to work and if they worked as hard as whites we could make it but that's not the context in which you're saying it the context in which you're saying it is that we are looking at a group of people 30 million people who this year will earn 300 billion dollars equal to the 14th richest nation in the world we're 12 percent of the population we buy 18 percent of the orange juice 20 percent of the rice 26 percent of cadillac cars etc 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 uh we have 350 black organizations middle class blacks 
one million of which go to white hotels each summer. They spend $16 billion discussing white racism and black poverty. Now, I, there's no way in the world that white people can free black people because freedom is not white people's to give. Two, white people, as I said in the piece, cannot do for us what we refuse to do for ourselves. Three, the key to this equation is the behavior of the black middle class. The key to this is not understanding whether or not whites like blacks or blacks like whites. I frankly have no interest in that at all. I have no interest in managed society. I'm not interested in having to sit next to people because they're white. I'm interested in being equal. And the only way you're equal is to have power. Alan Keyes said the most cogent thing said here tonight, and that is we are talking about power, not whether or not white people have been fair, not whether they're nice people, not whether or not black people are good or bad, but whether or not you as a community of people have the instruments of defense and in some cases of aggression to protect your turf and or your interests. You can't have 30 million people handing over to another people. 100% of their resources and blaming them for 100% of their problems. That is not intelligent. So what we need to do in the black community is A, decide to be competitive. And the only way we're going to be competitive is to use our resources. And the final thing I'd like to say is this. The primary resource we have as a people is not our money. It's what we know. And what you know is called human capital. And the fleet of, of, of human capital from the black community has been enormous in the name of integration. We've lost our brains to the, to the white community and nobody is there for the intergenerational transfer yes. of inter information from middle class yes. people to poor people so we now have what we call so-called underclass yes. people. But if what you know is that critically important, and I don't know anybody who will argue it, how is it possible in the light of Mr. Kozol's night marish and brutally honest and well-researched review of the horror story of public education, especially in the inner cities, for black children to know anything. White power structure and the white community in America are out of options. They can no longer afford racism and they can no longer afford school systems that don't work for this following reason. In eight years, over 50% of the population workforce will be female and non-white. In 30 years, this will be a majority numerically non-white nation. If we do not train women and non-whites to go into the workforce for high-tech skilled jobs in the next eight years, none of us in this room is going to have a job at all. So Mr. Kozol, there's another uh, dimension to what he is saying, and I'm sure he's more than aware of it, and that is, it is not black schools that have failed. The American school system has failed. It is not the ones who drop out that are the problem. The ones who graduate are the problem. We do not have a school system that does anything for post-secondary education, and we don't have a school system that does anything for the bottom 50%, which is why Germany and Japan are beating our brains out. Regardless of the color of the students. Regardless. Now, when you get to blacks, we cannot leave out yes. of this equation yes. the black middle class. And we cannot leave out of this equation, no matter what the government does, and the government should do something. Right. We cannot leave out the obligation of the black middle class to transfer its wealth, primary wealth, which is human capital or information, to yes. those in our community who don't have yes. it. May I ask the, uh, you're a capitalist with a... I am uh, not a capitalist, and you said that before. I'm not interested in proving capitalism. I'm interested in using a free market system to alleviate the problems in the black community. Is capitalist I, a bad word? Well, if the way you're using it is though I am trying to prove that this system is better than that system. No, I, I... I'm not into ideology. You can call me anything you yeah. want. You're a businessman who I, takes full advantage look, of the free market am, opportunities. Let me I put it that way. I am trying to pay my rent and keep the phone. Very rate. good. Now, I don't know what you call that. Yeah. Whatever you call All that, right. that's what right. I do. Right. Now, now, okay, so I am simply interested in, in this. There are 30 million of us. We earn $300 billion. We spend 6.6% .6 of our money with one another, 95% with other people. I'm simply interested in creating structures right. so we can transfer that money back. And most of all, not to any black person in this room, but to poor black people, because the difference in the achievement of our community will not come from, poor, from middle class blacks like us who have done so well under affirmative action. Poor blacks didn't get a nickel. They're the ones who are hurting, which is why the black community is in such dire difficulty. Yes. We're leaving out a lot of things in this story. There are hardworking, good people working in community development corporations. And your emphasis, I like the piece that Tony did, your emphasis on middle class 
uh, African-American neighborhoods. And the growth of these neighborhoods in cities and in suburbs is something that mustn't be left out of this picture. Yes. Otherwise, people aren't going to try. Your point is made at a time when the middle class is identified with the NAACP, the Urban League, and the traditional we, co we shall overcome Neo uh, civil rights Neo leaders of the 50s and 60s yes, that Neo have Negroes. been all but abandoned and ignored yeah. by younger people, sister soldier yeah. included. And I, just, I, just, I, just, I think that the dice are loaded and that's what's left out of Mr. Brown's piece. Mm -hmm. See, there was a period of time in this country after uh, uh, re Reconstruction where African people owned a lot of land, owned a lot of businesses, and did a lot of things. But what happened was the American government, the Ku Klux Klan, and uh, other organizations organized in smashing that effort. So it's not that we haven't tried to own lands and have not organized businesses. It's that if you are African in America, or in Latin America, or in the Caribbean, or in the continent, you will be hunted no matter what you do. Because they do not want us to survive and become self-sufficient. Well, and you can say no, but you haven't lived this life. You haven't lived this life. I don't believe that. One is because it's always been bleak for black people. And the fundamental question first is, how do you build on the best of the legacy of the black freedom movement, which is a moral issue? We have to look for higher moral ground and then look the realities of power in the face. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is, ever since black folk have been here, our problem have, has been twofold. Too much poverty, too little self-love. To raise the issue of too much poverty means to raise the question, what is the distribution of power and wealth in our society? We live in a society in which 1% of the population own 37% of the wealth, 10% own 86% of the wealth. So all of those in this room are struggling for crumbs in a certain sense. At the same time, too little self-love, the white supremacist bombardment that Brother Wahad and, and, and Sister Soldier are talking about is real. The white supremacist bombardment against black beauty, African beauty, against black intelligence, African intelligence, black capacity, black dignity. Those two are inseparable but not identical. Which means at the same time, and this is what I think when, I, when, when, when Martin King talked about we're part of one garment of destiny, it was a description of our condition. We don't choose circumstances in which we find ourselves. Right. The ugly history that this brother's talking about is real, but alongside that ugly history, are Americans of all hues trying to hammer out democratic institutions because the higher ground is a claim of struggle for democracy. And so the question becomes, no matter how bleak the situation, yeah. how do we keep alive a substantive and precious ideal of democracy in light of our present circumstance? And the way in which you do that is to create multiracial coalitions with higher moral ground but looks at the realities of power and control and wealth. We have no other option, it seems to me. Uh -huh. And I refuse to be discouraged. I refuse to be disempowered by anybody who comes along and tells me that we black folk with our creativity, with our improvis improvisational sense, do not have the moral courage to link up with other folk who are willing to get us out of the hell in which we find ourselves. So, uh, so that uh, black people, brown people, people of all colors want to get to the same place. Well, and as to paraphrase, about, well, I, no, no, in a general sense, the same. We're, we're in a situation. Senator, <laughs> Senator, that's, that's it, Senator excuse that's me, it, Senator Bradley of the all-white United States Senate said we can't get there unless we all go there together. Sorry, none of us are where he is. That's number one. Number two, you're making an, a moral appeal mm -hmm. to a country that doesn't have a moral conscience. Right. The question becomes that when white people feel serious and angry and upset about abortion, they come out in the thousands up to the millions to say this is what we believe about abortion. Where is the white outcry against white racism that murders African people all around this entire globe? It doesn't exist. So who are these white good people? I want to meet them. I want to I see know them. I, I, I know he was not enough. But that's, and, 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 that, that and, might be all we can get. Uh,
And guess what? I don't work with all I can get. What I work with is what I have. Listen, you have to have some confidence yes. in the power of African people amongst ourselves to establish a foundation. We have. I'm mean, no, we have it. We have, we have utter chaos in our cities, and you've got There's to no see that. Institutions we you can, build? can have a program. I can say, I'm not saying we built a lot of institutions, sure. and those institutions have not been effective. The majority of millions of African youth in this country are dying mentally, dying spiritually, dying emotionally, dying academically, and you may have a program, Mr. Brown may have a program, but what we got to talk about is an American government that tracks millions of African people who don't go to your program, don't go to Brown's program, millions of African people, not only here, but all around the world, and if we are not honest enough to say who are our friends, who are our enemies, to know what a friend is, to know what an enemy is, we will constantly be trying to get into people's parties, to shake our butts with them, to get them to like us, and that's not the question. The question is, what can we build amongst ourselves to secure ourselves from our enemies so that we will be able to survive into the future? What I heard Mayor from, Kelly, Mayor Kelly wanted to say. That's not what I heard from Cornell West. There are lots of oases of hope in spite of all of what Sister Soldier says is true. And the sad and pitiful part of it is that the 6 o'clock news, the 11 o'clock news, most of the media never gives attention to it. And if that weren't bad enough, we know that maybe white America is not going to believe that there are oases of hope where people are empowering themselves as we have in Washington, D.C., Jackie West taking over her own housing, leading to her own ownership in a community. But the sad and tragic part is that our own community buys into their sense of powerlessness. We surrender to the power of the white man as if we were not the descendants of the first civilization, as if we were not an empowered people. That I never, I never surrender to anybody, but I'm wise enough to know that if I walk out Washington, D.C. tonight, some black kid in Washington, D.C. is blowing off another black kid's head for a pair of sneakers because the institutions that we're talking about, not the things that we hold up and say, look, this is one example. The institutions that we're talking about are not saving the minds of those African children. Now, that is the honest truth. You have none of these Negroes save me. None of these Negroes Your mother didn't help save you. None of them. Now, none of these Negroes. Listen, you know who saved me? A man named John DeSane in Inglewood, New Jersey, who told me who I was, who showed me my history, who told me who my enemies were, who let me know that this was not an easy world, who let me know that this was a cold environment, who let me know. Now, what he's not a part of is dilly-dallying with the minds of African children and letting them know what the real situation is in America. Apparently, they will be killed if they do not know. left out some very important facts. apparently left out some very important facts because I think that I hear everything that you're saying, but if you are going to tell me that in the course of this country's history through slavery, civil rights, and so forth and so on, everybody who's come before you, everybody who's come before you sold this out, failed, etc., etc., then somebody hasn't told you your history. If the white power structure in this country is going to be said to have destroyed everything black, then you are indicting black That's people as well. We That's were, in fact, said. and we are you today engaged in a struggle. We are, in fact, and we were today in many ways, and you can see it on the street, engaged in a kind of warfare in which our survival is at stake. But don't tell me we have won no battles in that war. None of us would be sitting here at all if some people have won. I don't know if it's fair to suggest that, there, that not, she's saying there have been no victories. It lacks integrity, especially from a black man in the Republican Party. But, 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 it yes, lacks wait, integrity. Hold, hold, yes. hold up, hold up, hold up. Let's yes. just make something clear here. This woman has never said that we're supposed to disregard our victories and just focus on, on, on right. the failures. You can't have no justice in this country without equality, and you cannot have in this country any peace without justice. So when you talk, when this man sits over here and, 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 and tries to berate Sister Soldier and say that what she is saying, okay, is that we haven't accomplished anything. The woman is basically saying that before you can liberate a people, you have to first liberate your mind and stop kissing the behind right. of white Republicans and white right. Democrats and thinking that you're getting ahead. This must be, this must be the time for the president of Boston University, John Silver, 
to make what point, sir? Well, I, I, want, to, I want to say that I, I think the, the, uh, the claim that there's no conscience among the white people in America is a great example of racism. I don't think the face of racism is any prettier when it's black racism than when it's right, no white racism. racism. And I'd like, to, I'd like to finish this. When Martin Luther King started his civil rights movement, he put his conscience before the American people and shamed an overwhelming majority of the white people by the strength of his moral argument. And the elevation, the elevation, and the elevation of his moral argument was based on many of the things that he had learned from the individuals he cited in the letter from a Birmingham jail. Plato, Socrates, Jefferson, Augustine, Amos, Isaiah, Jesus. Uh, he recognized very well that he was fighting for the reform of a racist American, America on the basis of the views held by the dominant white society and for that reason he reached them and he so he so transformed them that you could pass the civil rights legislation under well, Lyndon so Johnson. And there is no, and there is no, and there is no point. There is no point. And there is no point. And his political uh, position if, if it, evolved. He was what? killed and because somebody, he became and if somebody more independent wants, and, and more critical of the American government. You know, government. why don't you let me finish? If, if somebody you thinks that, that you, you refute what you I have to say, that if you think that, that you refute what I have to say by pointing out that Martin Luther King was assassinated, I can point out to you that Malcolm X was assassinated. That's not the refutation. Of what you're saying. Man. He was assassinated you know, by a black man who hated white people. No, no, no. no. Let me say this. Let me, no, no, Phil, I got to say this. Because we always go to white males to tell us what's happening. You see? Let me tell you something. This is such a lie, a crock of crap. Because the reason why the United States, the only reason why the political leadership in the United States conceded to integration, conceded to civil rights for black people, is because the majority of the people of the world, of the world in the 1960s were ascending to political power and independence. And the United States could not claim more leadership of the world and enslave black people in a system right. of Jim Crowism. Right. So don't make like they, that, Malcolm, that, that, that Martin Luther King appealed to the better uh, uh, half or the morality of white America. White America did what was expedient politically. Mr. Cole was all I wanted to say. I just wanted to say this. I, I've had, I have sat on panels on television 25 years ago and heard exactly the same today between you, white and black and within the ranks of black people. And that underlines what's on my mind today. I mean, walking in the poorest streets of New York and Chicago nowadays, looking into the eyes of these kids, I just think to myself, nothing has changed. So many years, so many lives. I, I know you like to end these shows on some kind of optimistic note, but, you but can't I do can't, it. I feel right. despair. May I ask for the, may I ask the panel to comment on this? Here's what I think is, you wanted to say, Professor West. Yeah, see, despair is paralyzing. If, if, if it is as bad as we know and you say, that, that's precisely why we have to do something. That's precisely why rage as real and authentic as it is, cannot have the last word. We are people of hope. That's why we go to church on Sunday. That's why we party on Friday. That's why we come to these kind of little meetings. Because we've got to find some hope in this situation. Yeah, there is, there is and the hope is grounded in and, uh, and looking at the situation for what it is. Dr. Rage is not a marketable commodity. As we started this program, I said there's been a lot of growth and a lot of change in the way people People of different incomes, African-American people, live in suburbs and cities. And there's a lot to build on. I think Cornell West is right. I think you're too hard on it. I think Tony Brown is talking about things that are happening and can happen and that we can build on. I, I 25 years ago, I wasn't a member, but I was the research director of the Kerner Commission. And I do not believe that things are worse. And I think sure. that uh, uh, we have a ways to go. And we've got to keep going. And I couldn't agree more with Cornell. Despair is not helping. Yes, but I'll tell you what I do believe. If I, I get my gray hair entitles me to say that 25 years ago I presided over similar uh, events. And I do see somewhat of a difference, Mr. Kozo. We were in those days more into great society. Oh, my God, look at the sins we've committed here. We're going to help you with white powerful, wealthy America. Now I hear more and more young people of Sister Soldier's age bracket uh, speaking out to say, 
We've got to do this ourselves. People get the impression that when you're an activist that you don't also do business, that you aren't also involved in programs, that you don't also attend church. You can do all of these things and still see the savage inequalities and the evil of this society. And the reason why we speak clearly and fiercely and strongly about it is because if we don't, you have people suffering in silence who never get the opportunity to be on the, the you know, with Phil Donahue, who never get, see, we can't look at the world as, as, as the mayor of Washington, D.C. or as Cornell West, the author. You see what I'm saying? You got to look through the eyes of the majority of your children, how they see the world, what they feel, you know, the pain that they experience, how they would, excuse me, how, how they, how they, how they, how they would be, how they would be blind. We are forgetting. The evil is all over. Right now, right now in South Africa, African people are in a system of I mean, this argument is the same as 25 yeah. Look at this dynamic. Look at this dynamic. I want, I want people to understand this dynamic. You have a black man over here. Yes. He didn't cut nobody. No, let me tell you understand. He didn't cut. He didn't cut this guy off over here. He didn't cut him off. Talking about he walked through the. He walked through the ghetto. I live in the ghetto. You know. I go. I, oh, I will cut you off now. So now uh, he didn't. He didn't do that. You see, what I want you to understand is this: is that it's very, it's very important that when when we speak, at least when I speak. Okay, I'm going to speak the reality of black people who don't have a voice. There's no such thing as freedom of speech in America. Okay, and, and therefore, and therefore, when this man could talk about building, building grassroots organizations and power bases, and Tony could talk about recycling programs, and not one of them, not one of them could probably name one black political prisoner that's a consequence of trying to do those very programs. And then this sister tries to point out, this sister tries to point out, she I ain't gonna let you cut me off. This sister tries to point out, this sister tries to point out some very basic and fundamental contradictions. Is it possible that a cup of coffee between these various factions would allow all of us a cup of coffee, a meeting, a talk? Why the anger? Why, why? You are interpreting intensity for hostility. And what I'm trying to explain to you is, is that if there's no freedom of speech in this country, when you do get to speak, you speak the truth, you speak clear, you speak fiercely, and you don't care whether you like it or not. Right. I just want to say very briefly, the people who are really forgotten, sure, I think the people who are forgotten, especially in the black community, there are a lot of people out there who go to work, who take care of their families, who raise their kids, they are the people who are silently struggling against the odds, who have respected decent values, who have gone out, they haven't committed crimes, they are not in jail, the vast majority of black people have always been decent working class people, and I think that they are also the heroes of the struggle, I think they are also people who deserve our respect. I I think they're also people who deserve a voice that will speak from their silence. What are you talking about? Nobody else is going to. I don't care who calls me names. I will what speak for my about? parents. I will speak for the people who did everything against the odds to bring decent folks into the world, who didn't commit the crimes, who just what did crimes the jobs about? that nobody else would do so that we could move forward. I'll speak for them yes. any day of the week. I understand the anger. The anger is real, legitimate, and well-founded. But, but it extends to you. It goes to... Oh, I think that that's part of the, I think that's part of the pain and anguish of our system. Yeah. That so often that anger gets self-directed at our own community. And quite frankly, as I said earlier, to me it all offer, ultimately suggests that we give more power to the man than we give to ourselves. And I, for one, believe that we have the capacity in spite of the odds, to be an oasis of hope, as Cornel West has pointed out, but in no way should that mean there should be any abdication of responsibility on the part of white America. White America owes us a lot, and I'm not going to walk away from demanding what she owes us. You wanted to say it. Yeah, I want to say this word. I mean, just speaking personally, that I'm part of these kind of conversations all the time and have been part for 25 years. When I hear Brother Jihad put forward his view, I've heard that view, I can embrace the insights, I can criticize what I disagree with, but I'm looking for any insights I can. Same is true with Sister Tell Soldier, the spirit of resistance that she has. Without that spirit of resistance, the hope that I'm talking about would be dead in the black community. Right. Though I may disagree with a whole host of other claims she makes. So it's not in that sense viewing it as hostility. Mm -hmm. This is struggle. There's a sense of urgency, but I think I'm right. And I think I'm right in this sense, that after we move together looking for ways in which, not just justice, but self-affirmation of humanity, sense of self-confidence, all of those intangibles that are part and parcel of race and racism in America, 
that one will find that one will have to hook up with other human beings who are willing to take the risk and make that leap for the higher moral good. May I ask briefly from the panel, and I beg you to be brief, where are we going now? Give us your own prescription here as to what should be done. May I please ask the entire panel to speak to that? Well, no matter what the disagreements are, one common thread is clear. Power must be removed from the hands of centralized institutions and put back at the base of the pyramid, in the hands of people at the grassroots. Whatever your analysis, everybody who has spoken here today, I think, comes to that common conclusion, and we've got to work to make it happen. Thank you for your brevity, Dr. Nathan. Uh, I think we've got to build new strong institutions in the community. They're out there. We can help them. We're doing it. We can do it better. Mr. Sullivan, please. To the African youth that you have to educate yourself, don't depend on black leaders because most of them are insincere. And don't uh, depend on white America to embrace you because it will not. Dr. Uh, Mr. Kozo. I think white people have to spend more time talking about the the injustices which we perpetrate. I'd like to see some books written in the future, not about the problems of the underclass, but about the psychological distortions of the people who created that underclass. Ms. Smith. I would agree and say that many veils have to be lifted, and this is why I originally started my remarks by saying that I think the issue of race is more than a black and white issue, so that we need to hear from more people, because it is very complex. President Silver. I think the founding fathers were quite correct in noting the inadequacy of human nature and the importance of the division of power. To that reason, for that reason, I agree with Alan Keyes that we've got to divide power and put it back in the hands of as many as possible. America. I think America is on top of a powder keg that could uh, tear us to smithereens, or we can begin to invest in our diversity and make us a real force in the 21st century, but we're going to have to start making that decision quickly. I think that uh, the foremost message that um, we have to address is that white America has to come to grips with its own conscience and its own moral corruption. Mr. Monroe. I think that while black people can and should do more for themselves and while we have to look for coalitions, we must demand that the government of this country treat all of its people, provide opportunities for all of its people at the same level. Mr. Uh, Mr. Brown. Uh, black people and white people are basically the same. Most of us are average. We have a few geniuses and liberal sprinkling of fools. Democratic ideal is the most precious ideal in the world, but it's the proximate solution to insoluble problems, and therefore the cure for democracy is more democracy, and black people must always be democratic in form and content in their organizations and shoot for democratic ideals so that ordinary people can live lives of decency and dignity. From the Cambridge Multicultural Arts Center in Cambridge, Massachusetts, I am pleased to say on behalf of all those here gathered, uh, a note of uh, thank you and appreciation to those of you who stayed with us for this uh, very, very um, uh, serious undertaking. And to say on behalf of public television, we are pleased that you joined us. We hope that you found these two hours worth your time. And we say to you, farewell. <laughs>